there. Oh, uh, I'm so sorry. It's beautiful. I'm sorry, my friend, uh, my colleague here, John, is in London. So I'm, I'm sorry for John, but it's, uh, it's 29 here in Sydney. It's absolutely a beautiful day. <laughs> It's I, excellent. I'm sorry. It, it absolutely <laughs> shines through, shines through the screen. <laughs> Sometimes I blur my background so I don't make my uh, London colleagues too sad. <laughs> <laughs> We've got fair weather here too, so, so it, it's okay. Yeah. I, I don't feel that much envious. <laughs> Actually, I think we're having a Taiwanese day today. Oh, We've cool. already had we've already had showers and uh -huh. sunshine showers sunshine so ah, i'm very okay. in, i'm very in keeping with your spirits today i think <laughs> okay <laughs> now i wanted to tell you since the last time um i met you i've changed roles so i'm now in kpmg impact and yep. i'm working with john it's a new structure in kpmg and our overarching uh, platform is the sustainable development goals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very exciting so um, we're doing a series of podcasts um, uh, to talk about some of the themes under the SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we wanted to talk to you about today. Uh -huh. And the podcast will go on our KPMG Impact website. Okay. Well, since yeah. this is a podcast, uh, I will also have a local no. track where it's just my okay. voice oh. and I can send it to you yeah. afterward for maximum quality. Oh, look, Matt, John's got uh -huh. one too. Okay. And I must confess, I've just bought one, but I've, I'm on my training wheels. I don't know how to use it yet. <laughs> 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 okay, so do you have any questions? Otherwise, I'll launch straight in. Yeah, I, I think the, the revised uh, list of questions is really good. Um, so, um, I mean, is the speed that I'm speaking okay for this podcast audience, or should I uh, temper the speed a little bit, speak a little bit slower? John, what do you think? No, I think it's. I think it'll be fine. Um, I, I think you, 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 you're very clear and audible. Okay, mm. okay, excellent. Okay, so, so let's just dive right in. Okay, let's go. You going to call us down, John, or are we on? Welcome to our KPMG Impact podcast. I'm Ruth Lawrence, a senior executive with KPMG Impact, a global initiative designed to build a more sustainable and resilient future. Before we begin our conversation today, I'd like to acknowledge that many of us listening to this and meeting today are actually on the land of our First Nations people. And I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging leaders and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. KPMG Impact is highlighting the sustainable development goals in our podcast. And today I have the great pleasure to speak to Minister Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. We're talking about social innovation in Taiwan, how we see innovation solving critical social problems, promoting economic growth and offering new ways to address the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Minister Tang, I've heard that you're enthusiastic about the Sustainable Development Goals. Where did that passion start? Well, uh, it goes way back. Um when I was six years old, my mom uh, co-founded with a few other homemakers the Homemakers Union, which is Taiwan's one of the Taiwan's uh, earliest environment protection foundations. And they advocated for low carbon life, green consumption, green diet, green energy, and so on. Around the turn of century, uh, we switched to a co-op lifestyle uh, where uh, the Homemakers Union's consumer co-op um, did this um, like purchase to the agricultural land uh, that is committed to the pollution-free and low-carbon way of uh, farming, sometimes organic farming and so on. And nowadays I, I cook also uh, myself and I make sure to use uh, such material. So, I mean, sustainability is, as far as I remember, it just runs in the family. Fantastic. So it sounds like it's uh, been a very long journey and it's part of your DNA. Mm -hmm. um, what, what opportunities have you had to work on the sustainable development goals in your current position? Yeah, um, so I often uh, say that digital, which in Mandarin is uh, a uh, wordplay, uh, Shu Wei also stands for plural. Uh, and plural means that we have many different values, societal values, environmental values, economic values. However, the digital technology enables these different values to make account to one another so that we can see, actually we do share many 
common values around inclusion, innovation, and sustainability, of course. So my main contribution, I guess, is to make sure that no matter if you're registered uh, as a co-op or as a university with the university social responsibility programs or a listed company with CSR or GRI reports and so on, all the different organization types use the same 169 as digital targets as a shared vocabulary to make accounts to one another. And so on the social innovation database, which uh, lists more than 500 uh, organizations, I offer them my office hours where they can meet me every Wednesday for 40 minutes at a time for the on the record conversation of how to collaborate with other sectors friends and also running the presidential hackathon where the top five uh, social innovation ideas gets the trophy from the president that's a projector that projects uh, the commitment from the president saying whatever you did in the past three months will become presidential problems for the next 12 months as a national policy. There's a lot of information there. Can you tell us a bit more about the hackathon? How, how many of you had up till now? Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we're on our fourth uh, year now, and each year, as I mentioned, uh, five champions are selected. Uh, and the selection process itself, I think, is very interesting, which is only possible using digital technology, because each year we have more than 200 different ideas, each corresponding to one or more of concrete SDG goals. And then, uh, because no jury panel is an expert in all 169 areas, uh, we make sure we work with collective intelligence so our national participation platform, the joint platform, which lists more than 10 million visitors in a country of 23 million, each visitor get a 99 tokens. So with this token, they can vote for the SDG projects they're interested in. This is a new way of voting called quadratic voting. Uh, and this is a mechanism designed that makes sure if you really like a project, you can vote more than one vote, but it's going to cost you more. So with two votes, that's cost four tokens, three votes, nine tokens. So with 99 tokens, one can vote for nine votes, which is 81 tokens, but not 10, which would cost 100. Uh, and then with 18 still left, right? Uh, people are motivated to look for some synergies with the project they just get voted. Uh, and maybe they do four votes, and which is 16 uh, tokens, and there's two tokens left, and they're more motivated to look to another two SDG targets. And in this way, we make sure we popularize the idea of synergies between the SDG targets and people end up doing a maybe seven and seven and so on. So people uh, on average vote for like five or six different goals, different targets uh, with the 99 tokens that they have. And the upshot is that when we select the top 20 for the incubation, everybody feel they have won. I like the older voting methods where maybe 49% of people feel they have lost. <laughs> it sounds like um, a, a very innovative voting scheme. Mm -hmm. and uh, one that we should be looking into. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about some of the ideas that have actually come out of the hackathon mm -hmm. um, and that have actually gone further? I have heard about um, mm -hmm. an innovative weather platform, extreme uh -huh. weather event platform. Um, would you like to tell us about some of those? Certainly. So um, the earliest uh, hackathon idea are now all um, policies that's been implemented for a while. For example, the Civil IoT Taiwan project, uh, born out of the earlier hackathon ideas about the air pollution map and the water level map and so on, is now a fully fledged distributed ledger that's contributed by the civil society. For example, primary school teachers and students that measures air and water quality as part of their environmental education education program. So instead of teaching about media literacy or data literacy, uh, with these ideas we teach about media and data competence, meaning that the young students, they are producers and stewards of data, not uh, just consumers of data. And with this, of course, the idea of data bias, responsibility, data collisions, and so on, become a part of a very natural curriculum for people to contribute. And using these systems, uh, which enabled more accurate prediction of weather models, um, of the, for example, water levels that causes evacuation needs, and then we send automated warnings, including earthquake warnings, and so on. That then powered, uh, during the COVID, uh, the mask availability map, which is essentially also a distributed ledger, but instead of uh, mapping the uh, water or air pollutions, uh, it maps whether some pharmacies still have masks in stock. And similarly, the advanced warning system, which runs on SMS, became uh, 
the digital quarantine system, uh, which warns uh, when people doing home quarantine left their home uh, more than 50 meter radius, uh, they and the local medical officer receive an automated SMS and so on. So I think uh, it enables us to fight the pandemic successfully without lockdowns and fight the infodemic successfully, the disinformation crisis with no takedowns, thanking to these public infrastructures, digital ones, that uh, has people's broad input and people already understand the cybersecurity and privacy uh, parameters of these. We're not declaring emergency state or inventing new data collection points during the pandemic. Wow, that's very interesting around the pandemic and that new software. What do you think was key for your population to actually embrace that software and use it and make it successful? Well, because they wrote it. Right. Uh, <laughs> this is what we call a, a people-public-private partnership. The people, mm -hmm. the social sector uh, came up with these ideas in the first place. And the public sector endorsed these ideas instead of beating them, we, we joined them, right? So we embraced mm -hmm. the, the best ideas that uh, is worth spreading, worth amplifying, uh, and the public sector supports without controlling uh, the data governance, for example. And so because of this, the social sector could be uh, rest assured that this is not about uh, surveillance capitalism, this is not about state surveillance, but rather this what we call participatory self-surveillance, uh, where people review the data for the public good only if they consent to it and also only if they understand the repercussions. Mm -hmm. Government's not always keen to share data or decisions. Can mm -hmm. you tell, a bit, tell us a bit more about your radical transparency policy? Sure. Um, so... This very conversation while we're having, uh, I'm doing a full recording, uh, and we usually uh, publish the recording as is uh, on the Creative Commons platforms or make a transcript after co-editing by 10 days, publish it as the public domain. And this has two effects. The first, the people who come to me to visit me uh, for a conversation or interview or lobbying, they always lobby for the public good. Uh, for the like seven generations down the line because they understand it will look very bad for the uh, upcoming generation if they lobby for something that's only good for the short term for themselves at the expense of other corners in the world. So this is a way to make sure that uh, the better parts of us uh, are in part of those conversations. And the second thing is that because people understand uh, the why of policy making instead of just what are the resulting policies. So even if the resulting policies um, has mistakes, uh, even if we did it incorrectly and so on, the social sector has the context upon which to make better suggestions or in the uh, parlance of open source development to fork the government, to take the government's plans and make a different direction, a different contribution. So we had, for example, the opposition party's member of parliament uh, doing the uh, analysis on the mask availability and rationing, pointing out that we were too happy in the government uh, to announce that the population center and the pharmacy distribution match almost um, like exactly, and she said, um, and P. Gao Hongan said, uh, actually, if you look at the rural places and correlate with the open street map, you will see that the time cost for the rural people to reach the nearby pharmacy, even though it's the same uh, distance by helicopter, it's not the same. And by the time they reach the pharmacy, maybe the pharmacy has already closed and so on. So there's a bias in the data. There's a bias in the way that we analyze the data. And once this is pointed out, then our minister, Minister Chen, simply said, legislator teach us. And then her interpolation became the new distribution method, uh, complete with pre-ordering 24-hour mass pickup and so on the very next day. So like literally within 24 hours. This would not be possible unless we publish whatever we have uh, collected in real time. Mm. So transparency pushing along for social good. Yep. I'm wondering about some of the partnerships that have been forced Forge. So one of the SDGs specifically focuses on partnerships. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about some of the partnerships that have been forged um, in your work on COVID. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, so when we talk about people-public-private partnership, we do rely on the private sector to scale out the solutions that's co-developed by the people and the government. So for example, when I mentioned the four convenience store chains in Taiwan, um, they have more than twice the number of stores compared to the professional pharmacies. So when they joined uh, around March, they dramatically extended the reach for people to get the PPEs so that by the time they joined, uh, I think uh, we have 
almost half of people uh, having access to medical grade mask. But right after they join by early April, uh, we have three quarters of people. And at that time, uh, we reduce the basic reproduction value of the coronavirus, the R0, to be under one. And so that we've been largely COVID free uh, ever after uh, April. And so without the scaling out of the distribution center, the logistics of the four convenience stores, without, for example, the uh, Google CSR group supporting the necessary computation powers for the initial prototype of the mask availability. And so uh, this would not be so uh, quickly deployed to every corner in the Taiwanese society. But when pi private sector joins, uh, we make sure that they respect the same cybersecurity and privacy boundaries set by the previous social sector uh, prototypes. I know in some of your work that um, around developing social innovation, one of the first platforms was to look at values and to get values uh, more immersed in the mm -hmm. culture to yep. develop social innovation. I'm wondering if you could tell us about how some of that work has led to where the success of these partnerships today. Certainly. So uh, when we're looking at uh, the common values in emerging technologies, we see a lot of potential for, for example, labeling uh, one another. Like when uh, in 2015, UberX uh, first came to Taiwan, they said, oh, this would enable more efficient routing of public uh, transportation options. And so would reduce, for example, uh, the uh, wasteful like taxi uh, idling by and things like like that. On the other hand, there's people who say, this is not really sharing economy, this is more like a gig economy, this will destroy the social solidarity formed by workers unions and taxi associations and so on. And of course, they all have pretty good points. However, um, if we look at the core values that everyone uh, supports, it's very uh, apparent that everyone wants a more fair uh, like meter, uh, everyone wants uh, proper insurance registration, not undercutting existing meters and so on. But this is uh, not a rough consensus readily understood by people in the more anti-social corner of social media, such as Facebook. Uh, the uh, controversial points get far more attention and calories and clicks uh, than the more <laughs> nuanced ideas uh, that I just outlined. Right? So we need to build a pro-social social media instead of the more anti-social corners of social media. So we work with a Seattle startup, um, a social enterprise, now a nonprofit uh, called Polis. And we deployed that and showed people that if you uh, remove the reply button, but encourage people to resonate or not on um, each other's feelings. So instead of jumping straight to the decisions, we just share how you feel about the UberX situation. And after three weeks of voting just on the feelings and visualizing the common feelings, people discovered that um, actually most of the people agree with most of their neighbors on most of the points, most of the time. Uh, they agree to disagree on a few ideological points like platform economy versus gig economy, but by and large, we do have shared values. And so this is when we realized that if we build a platform that highlights the common values and rewards a more nuanced idea of inclusion and diversity as uh, represented by the uh, user interface, instead of uh, just rewarding the clickbait, like short-term attention span and calling it quote-unquote engagement, uh, then we actually have a pretty good public infrastructure. Also on the digital realm, the internet doesn't have to be bad for discussions. And that led to better co-creation in common values. Mm, mm. Oh, thank you. You've mentioned several social enterprises in our discussion already. Mm -hmm. How have social enterprises fared during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they are very, very important because they have on the one side uh, the trust of the social sector and then the link uh, to the private economic sector. So they can both crowdsource the best ideas and then turn those ideas uh, to production. So um, I think uh, one of the most exciting things uh, during the COVID-19 is that people are more aware that those digital social innovations are also pretty good business. Uh, these uh, infrastructure that I just mentioned about tracking the PPEs, about making sure that people get the, uh, like physical distancing and now vaccination information correctly and so on, um, are 
are widely applicable in other domains as well. This uh, bot that automatically clarifies this information uh, about PPEs could also be used to clarify other scams and disinformation as well. So we get a lot of leading companies such as uh, Trend Micro, the leading antivirus company, investing heavily uh, into a, a new tool that just uh, clarifies uh, the online scams and disinformation and so on, the uh, so-called Mythbuster. Uh, and uh, who's called a leading uh, company for like online uh, scams and so on detection also developed uh, the main UE, another bot uh, that will, uh, in, when you invite it into a group chat, automatically uh, compare incoming pictures and so on, like a virus scanner, and then show you like a uh, very fun, uh, like meme uh, dogs and cat pictures and so on that will uh, have this humor over rumor effect so that when you laugh about it, uh, you vent this. Uh, idea of uh, outrage and then you wouldn't uh, share this uh, disinformation and wouldn't increase its basic reproduction value but would instead uh, share this very cute dog's message about, uh, for example, wear a mask to protect yourself against your own unwashed hands, uh, and so on. So uh, people see generally that anything that fulfills the public good and catches the public attention and imagination is also good business. Mm -hmm. It's taken uh, a few years to come to this level of maturity in terms of alignment of values, in terms of the social enterprises, in terms of the ecosystem and the development there and the, the maturity to serve the public good. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you've reflected on what have been some of the key elements that have led to this success and maturation. I, I think... Uh just like uh, the Q spoke stock is essential uh, to our counter coronavirus uh, communication campaign, uh, the cute icons, uh, the 17 SDGs, as well as the icons for the specific targets uh, and the very pretty colors, uh, the 17 colors, I mean, uh, that actually play a really, really large part because uh, they're, they're quite uh, neutral. They, they don't uh, speak like uh, it is a, pre a preference to the non-for-profits. There's a preference uh, for the large industries. There's a preference for the state intervention, right? These 17 icons, they, they show people uh, living happily together, right? People in wheelchairs, people who are young, people who have uh, blindness or, or other disabilities and so on. Uh, they, they all look actually quite comfortable around each other in the SDG portrayal. Uh, and so I think this uh, iconography, uh, more than anything, uh, made sure that people see that that we may have very different positions, just like those colors, they're so contrasting with one another. But we can also form a, a circle, form a, a ring of sorts, and then uh, share this common space, this common values, and that uh, let us innovate and make things better. So reflecting on this uh, past five years, I think definitely without the SDGs and this related vocabulary and iconography, we wouldn't be that easy uh, to join up the pri previous very uh, like distributed sectors and some at odds sectors together toward the common ways. So fantastic, the, the actual icons playing a, a big part there in terms of mm -hmm. um, working together and actually symbolizing where we're heading towards. I'm wondering about the Social Innovation Lab at the mm -hmm. moment. What are the top conversations that are taking place? <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah. The uh, Social Innovation Lab, which is literally my office, um, as I mentioned, I'm there every Wednesday and anyone who is a registered social innovator can claim 40 minutes of my time and have conversations. Um, and I think partly because uh, I think of the presidential hackathon, uh, people nowadays care much more uh, about how to make a good business case uh, out of a social mobilization toward a shared environmental goal. Previously, we would have ideas that maybe just join two of the 17 goals together. But nowadays, I get the uh, pitch that joins at least three, sometimes five or six different goals together. For example, in the last year's presidential hackathon, um, there is this team called Circuit Plus, uh, and which has uh, already converted the Social Innovation Lab to one of their uh, check-in points. It's like a Pokemon Go game, uh, which you download on your phone, and it shows you where are the near by water refilling stations uh, that you can take your bottles to check in and then not only comment on how uh, warm or cold uh, or tasty
see the water is and have a real conversation about collect like gold coins and things like that uh, and then uh, leads you to nearby uh, like walks uh, that makes the community values the history and so on apparent just like the Pokemon Go makes the uh, environmental uh, characteristics apparent <laughs> with the selection of pocket monsters and then once you collect uh, throughout those walks um, then you also get automated notifications when the uh, temperature is getting hot like almost 40 degrees in summer around here in the recent years uh, to remind you to to drink more of this water you just collected so that you don't suffer uh, from heat damage uh, and then it also uh, after you collect those coins you can also spend these uh, on the social enterprises uh, products and services and so on and after uh, you form a habit of checking in like uh, 50 days uh, in a row uh, then it also reviews like exactly how many plastic bottles <laughs> that you have just saved and and how much impact it has uh, on the environment as a whole uh, and so all in all I mean just by describing uh, their play uh, style this is maybe six SDGs there already <laughs> and so this is uh, what I think is very interesting is that people are thinking about partnerships uh, with very unlikely uh, stakeholders nowadays and this really cheers me up. What a wonderful example with that complete interconnectedness between the, uh, the SDG, that's a wonderful example. And, and just finishing up now, um, what's on your agenda for this year? What's your big area of focus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this year uh, we're going uh, to announce to the world the National Action Plan on open government for the administration side and open parliament uh, on the legislature side. Uh, and with this, uh, we're taking the kind of uh, cross-sectoral partnership, the social innovation-based approach, and applying it not only in the administration's work, which is what the Social Innovation Lab is about, but also in other branches in the government also. Also. Uh, so, for example, the legislature is now thinking uh, about ways uh, to make sure that people can participate in the lawmaking process, not just in the rulemaking process, using the same uh, almost gamified uh, way that they can understand uh, more as part of their, for example, capstone projects in their high schools or in their universities. And there's also a commitment uh, as part of our referendum process, our uh, central uh, election committee uh, just announced that uh, this year not only they will introduce a electronic uh, counter signature system to augment the paper based one but they will also double down on the deliberation process that makes sure that people share the common values despite they uh, bringing up the like pro and con referendum topics so we can all agree on the common values before uh, going into the referendum station to make uh, choices those way or another and so on. Um, and so I think uh, I'm really heartened that these ideas of common values out of different positions and innovation uh, based on the common values is now taken up to other parts of the democratic process instead of uh, just uh, limiting our um, conversations about voting, which is essentially just three bits per person every four years. We're now increasing the bit rates of democracy and turning democracy into a type of technology, a social technology to come to think about it is also social innovation. Thank you so much for your time today, Minister Tang. It's been a complete pleasure, absolute pleasure to hear about uh, what's happening in Taiwan and some of those leading practices around government innovation, social innovation and the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you. Really good questions. I really enjoyed this conversation. Live long and prosper. <laughs> Thank you so much. My guest today has been Minister Audrey Tang, Digital Minister of Taiwan. Thank you all for listening and I hope this has given you some inspiration and a fresh outlook on how we can innovate to collaborate and work together on the SDGs for a better world.